Good evening, everybody. As uh, Angela already uh, explained, I have over 12 years of experience with all kinds of things like Agile and Scrum, and I've been a manager of Agile teams for uh, over seven years, and now for almost four years, I'm a uh, leadership consultant at ProWareness. And um, one, of, one of the things I saw is that there is a framework for the teams, there is Scrum, you've got Kanban, you've got Super 7, and all kinds of other frameworks, but there is not yet really a leadership framework. So over a year ago, I gave myself the challenge together with uh, a few other people, how can we discover a framework with the same power as Scrum for the teams, what's that for the leadership? And um, tonight is the first official launch of the GRIP uh, framework, the guide in paper. Um, over the last year, I've used parts of it in trainings and coachings on the jobs and during transformations. And over the past year, it evolved. And um, so I will tell you all about it. Um, what I've seen is that many managers have a huge variety of traditionals, traditional methodologies. But how do you respond at high speed when traditional management stuff don't really help improving the speed? Traditional management is all about resources. We call people resources at many companies. Do you guys call your people resources still? Yes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> there is a lot of focus on cost reduction, budgets. One of the metrics is all about reducing the cost. But what is the opposite of reducing cost when you want to increase your speed, when you want to increase your responsiveness? And a lot of us management are stacked with meetings. Who of you already got a first meeting around nine and had consecutive meetings until this moment? <laughs> yeah. During doing email, meanwhile, still doing emails. <laughs> <laughs> still doing emails and stuff like that because our agenda is stacked. And when we have a stacked agenda, we might probably deliver value because a not so stacked agenda feels a little bit awkward. I, I, I know that from experience. When I was a manager and at busy times and I felt it, everything was in place, I, my agenda proved it because I had a stacked agenda. But that not really did help. So I found out, and I have interviewed many people, what did they do to increase success? How did you increase your responsiveness? So what are new practices, new habits, new tools, new metrics? And I call that, that, that uh, union of stuff, I call that patterns. So what are new patterns to lead self-managing teams? One of the things that we need to do as an organization is to reduce the distance between customers, the strategy, and the teams. Really put the customer in the heart of the organization. What Ron was saying, they were focused much more on customers to increase the NPS from a lot of negative to less negative. <laughs> um, downstairs uh, with the session of um, uh, Mark Appel, they are also continuously experimenting with customers. And new organizations are able to put the customer in the center of the organization. But how do you do that? How do you bring the distance closely together between teams, customers, and the strategy? And another question is how do you not only reduce the time to market, but also reduce the time to learn? Reducing Many companies are still busy, struggling, finding ways to reduce the time to market. So that's the time it takes to have an ID, Build it, make it, create it, and then deploy it. That's the time to market. But if you want to be responsive, if you want to react fast on fi in fast changing markets, you have to be, oh, it's speeding up. You have to reduce your time to learn. So that's not only building it, having an idea, building it, deploying it, but also getting feedback from customers and learn from those feedback to improve your ID. So improving the whole cycle on strategic level. And many companies, they have a strategic learning loop of over a year. You, in, during September, you, you work on your strategy for next year, and the strategy is, is built in plans and details and budgets, and then on execution of the strategy, you focus on cost, whether you spend the budget as expected. But there is hardly any loop knowing whether you have the things you have thought of in September 
whether those are actually the right decisions. And what do customers actually say of the things you want to improve on your strategy? So how do you reduce the time to learn? And what I found out is that many managers are told to do nothing. They are told to change their habits and instead of uh, stepping in, taking control, telling people what to do, they are told to do nothing. Who of you has been told by an agile coach to sit on his hands and just trust the teams? <laughs> Anyone? Yeah? <laughs> just trust the teams, let go, and it uh, magically agile makes everything work just perfectly. And what I've seen is that has to do a lot with apple pies. Apple pies? Yes, it has to do a lot with apple pies. I'm turning 40. Yeah, you wouldn't guess that, right? I <laughs> but I'm really turning 40. And looking around, there is still life after being 40. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but, but sometimes it's, it's hard because um, staying on, on weight balance, having a proper weight balance and having the same cycle speed. One of my hobbies is to cycle and I, I just, I think I hit the, the maximum speed five years ago, something like that. And one of the habits that's struggling me to have my weight in balance and to uh, improve my uh, cycling time is apple pie. Because I don't know what's your favorite cake, but my favorite cake is apple pie. When there is a birthday or when I give a training and there is this, uh, this uh, uh, during the break you have those apple pie, I hardly can re can't resist the smell. And then I, when I have a right discipline, I say I don't, I sit on my hands. I, I just trust my diet and I won't eat apple pie. But then on a weak moment, I tend to eat a lot more apple pie than just uh, to compensate all the, for all those times that I didn't eat my apple pie. And I had to change my habits. I had to change my habits. So during a, a lunch break or during a birthday, I had to find something new besides doing nothing that would help me um, resist the apple pie. And I found afterwards, it sounds pretty easy, but for me, fruit is the solution, especially ma m stuff like mandarins and bananas. They are also very nice and, you and it's a lot better when you're around 40 for your weight balance. <laughs> Apples, yeah, that would be too easy. <laughs> Just skip the pie part and just start with apples, but <laughs> apples are also fine. <laughs> so when I look at the organizations, when you are a leader of self-managing teams, you have to find new habits for old habits. And one of the habits that's very strong with a lot of managers, that is the habit when the, when the cue is when you are feeling out of control. And your old habit, as I was when I was a traditional manager, I was to give orders, step in, tell people what to do, and that gave immediate relief be because people dropped the work they were doing and they were starting the doing the stuff that I was doing. But that gave a short time relief, but a long time, long term uh, uh, dissatisfaction. Why is it always me that has to step in? It seems to be me when I don't pay attention, when I let go, things go bad. Why is it always me that has to step in? And doing nothing because those Agile coaches tell you to let go and trust the environment and trust Agile. That doesn't help because it gives you stress and it somehow, often in many cases, it isn't solved. In some cases, it isn't solved. So one of the new things that you can do is to create, to improve the rhythm of a Scrum, of a scrum framework or to improve the meeting rhythm or improve, shorten the rhythm. That's one of the things that you can do. So as soon as you feel out of control, one of the new habits that you can develop is to organize a meeting with Scrum Master and product owners and talk about it. Share your thoughts, brainstorm together on solutions, and in many cases, as a lot of examples have been given throughout the day, in many cases, brainstorming with a group of people, then the idea is even better than the idea before. And this is one of those examples where the culture can be very tough, where the culture is hard to break. And what I find out is that when the stress levels are low, you already have to develop those new patterns, those new practices, those new habits, so that when the stress level is high and the, and the, uh, the urgency is hitting the ceiling, 
then you can already rely on the new habits. The new habits uh, are already common practices, common patterns. But how do you do that? And over the last year, I have brainstormed with many people. I have looked at several cases like Ron, but also other managers. And what did they do to be successful? Looking back over my over 12 years, when are the situations when things were successful? What are, what are common denominators? Is that a correct English word for that? What are common patterns? First, we start with the new role of the responsive leader. And where responsive is a combination of both lean and agile and stuff like that. So it's really on a higher level of management um, uh, than just agile management. And while I'm, I'm very fond of the, of the mindset of the servant leader, I think many of you guys know the, the servant leader. It's developed already in the 1970s. And the servant leader is already telling you a lot about the right mindset to lead teams. But in a fast changing environment, I was looking for a third dimension to add something on top of the servant leader. And we call that the exploring servant leader. Because the things that you have to do, the things that you have to lead your teams in, is not a steady, clear uh, environment. As Ron was explaining, it's a journey you have where you have to explore solutions and you have to facilitate uh, those solutions. So you have to be an experimenter. You have to create an environment where making experiments is safe. You have to build craftsmanship, create an environment where people grow, grow in their maturity and all the things that you can read here. And one of the most difficult parts for many leaders, it's the bottom part. It is the identity and passion. And I, I'm, one of the things that I love to do is, is, do in, is, is help people to really kind of refine their identity and passion. What I've seen is that when, le when, when leaders really let go of all things that they think they're a part of their identity, let go, and when they find their passion in, in life and that they really see the power of creating an environment where people feel that they matter, yeah, that's, that's, that's energizing, that, that really gives me the, the goose uh, kippenvel. Thanks. And that's so rewarding to create an environment where you feel that people grow and, and, and steadily and know, know their value and take ownership. So this is a part of the framework. Another part of the framework is the balance between sitting on your hands, giving trust and stepping in and doing new stuff. And when do you let go and when do you step in with the new habits and the new culture? That's difficult. That's very difficult. And it has a lot to do with raising kids. The mindset behind that it has a lot to do with raising kids. You cannot put your daughter of five years old when you see her making her your own sandwiches, her own sandwiches. You cannot send her to her to kamers, chambers. That sounds odd, but yeah. you cannot send her on her kamers. Um, but you have to mentor her, coach her until she's around 18, 20 before she is uh, old enough to go on her own. And that has to do between the balance between freedom and maturity. And a lot of managers, they hear from Agile and they give their teams a lot of freedom. What shall we do? Yeah, it's up to you now, we are doing Agile. And, um, and how can we do this? What do you think we should do? And then you end up in an environment where you give the people too much freedom without the proper maturity in the teams. And that causes a lot of risk tinkering, geprutsch in uh, Netherlands. <laughs> and that's bad. It's bad for your transformation, it's bad for your own skills, and it's not good. The opposite is when you find a right balance between maturity and freedom, but when you do not adapt to freedom when the teams grow. So things that might have worked a few months ago, you have to adapt. The, pa the things you discovered a few months ago, people, the people have grown in their maturity. Your five-year-old daughter is not 25 anymore. So you have to adapt and to, you have to stay in the middle. In the middle, I call ownership. And you as a leader, one of the mindsets that you should have is to, to, to instead of looking for details and plans, you, you have to be keen on ownership. 
you have to get an anten antenna, an, a, a power, whether the teams are in ownership or not. And, and creating an environment where people take ownership, that's very difficult. It needs a lot of soft skills, hard skills combination to create those environments. But people, they have to f have the balance between the freedom they get from upper, upper leadership and their own maturity. And what helps is to kind of create three, s three levels of maturity, for example, and really put on paper the freedom the teams get based on their maturity. And this also helps, and there was one of the workshops uh, Ingrid um, facilitated next door, this also helps in the balance between self-managing teams and other self-managing teams. For example, starting self-managing teams still have to discuss with the manager, with the manager on whether or not to hire people. While high mature teams can freely hire people, and perhaps depending on a lot of other things, they can also fire people high mature teams, but not every team is already high mature enough for to do that. Some low mature teams still need a lot of formal approval from risk and governments, governance in your organization. While high mature teams can have um, feedback sessions afterwards to share what with the risk and government governance departments what they have done and get over more equal uh, feedback on that. So also the risk and governance departments have to adapt the way they work with the teams depending on the maturity of the teams. A lot of stuff, eh? Yeah. Um, what, what I've discovered over the past year is that there are six things that are really common. Uh, also looking through your uh, ogare uh, today, you will see that, that many, many of these things are already mentioned. Ron has a few parts of these. This also the story of Gijs on ING has a few ingredients of this. And what I've seen is that when instead of going for detailed plans and steering on cost, you have to have these six things in place. <coughs> so this is really how you as a responsive leader can change the environment, create an environment. So for example, you want to create, uh, you want to improve the quality, or you want to improve the automatic testing, or you want to improve the lead nurturing or marketing automation or any other thing that normally you would do through detailed planning, cost budgeting and gen, gen charge. You can now do by using the GRIP pattern. So ask yourself the question of one of the topics that you were very busy with today, with all those hectic meetings, consecutive meetings, piled up meetings, Ask yourself one of the meetings that you had earlier today, where can I see it? <coughs> was there, of the topic discussed, was there something visual explaining the goal that we want to achieve? Did we have a regular set of events to talk about this topic? Or was it just a one-time meetup? Who, do we have an actual learning loop? So did we already got feedback from customers that it starts to improve? What is the current learning loop and what are we doing to improve that learning loop? Who is the owner? Am I the owner? Am I the person in charge um, uh, pulling uh, the, the improvement, creating, improving the lead, nurturing or not? And who is the team? What, what part of the team really takes ownership on it? Who is collaborating, sharing ideas, brainstorming together on those topics you, you, are, you had your um, uh, agenda filled with? And how is software serving us? So are we taking the benefits of software? Are, like uh, Gijs was explaining, are we still working very hard or are we automating stuff to use software? And just having those checklists and work with this checklist, add one thing the next week, add another thing the week afterwards, that's really helping to create a new environment where, the, where people take ownership and where the strategy and the customers and the teams are brought a lot more close together. And this is just an example that you can do for a lot of things. And within the GRIP guide we have a an, uh, 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 an few concrete patterns based on this. This is uh, for example for the brands. At one of the energy companies we have served them uh, creating brands based on this pattern. So they are cre having creating a brand for the metal industry. 
and they have a, a, have a visual how they are going to approach the, the metal industry, etc. And another company we are using to improve automatic testing using this pattern. And this really gives new structures, new behaviors, new meetings, new governance that really speeds up the organization. And what, I, what we have seen so far with the few customers that, uh, that the companies that are adopting to it, that these are the benefits. And, and tonight we want to share it to a lot more companies and we hope that a lot more companies can, can take the benefits of it. Because you as a manager, you as a leader, you have to adopt to new mindsets. You have to adopt to new behavior. You have to create a new structure. You have to create new overviews that go along with this new responsive mindset. And um, yeah, it will create an environment. And that's, that's one, of the, one of the most beautiful things in my job is that, that it, I see it over and over again, that there is this person that's almost a gray mouse. I don't know if that's a, an English saying, but in Dutch we call it a grijze mouse. And he's, he's, she is sitting behind her desk feeling not rewarded, feeling bad about him or herself. And thi also things at home start to go bad. Uh, uh, the, the partnership and the relationship is, is turning bad. And when you change the environment where people work in, and you, you value people, and people start to see that they are collaborating towards customer impact, that they get feedback from customers on that it really helped, that they are working with the team together on the visual stuff that are tangible, those person, they, they start to smile. They come become a very colorful mouse, so to speak. <laughs> and, and there is hardly anything more rewarding as a responsive leader as to have an environment where your people yeah, just continuously grow and, and feel rewarded. And I hope that it gives you the same benefits, this, this GRIP framework. It's not about the, gra the framework, but it is about creating an environment where people feel rewarded. And, and therefore, you have to create new patterns, patterns that match the new environment. And this GRIP framework is there a, a good starting point for.